Thanks for being here, you guys. Can so I it's such an honor to be here. It's my first visit to Villanova, so I'm excited to meet you all, see your beautiful campus. I'm thankful to Professor Hollis for inviting me. It was really kind. Um, and thanks to Deanna and, and Jim Alejo and other people who put this together behind the scenes. It was really um, nice of you to, to do that and to be continuing to work. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today uh, about my new book, but I'm going to um, probably talk less about trade policy as policy and think about how this actually affects us and our lives and what we eat and what we're going to be eating in a little while. So um, this is, you know, one thing that I like to spend a really embarrassing amount of time thinking about. Um, <laughs> food and good food and how we define it. Um, anyone want to throw out your own definition? How do you define good food? Does anybody have any personal manifesto? Yeah. Uh, like it just taste, good. taste. Yeah. yeah, so taste is important. Fresh. Fresh. Good. Anybody else? Healthy. Healthy. All together, taste, fresh, healthy. It's like a good combo, maybe? Do you not care if it's healthy? Is it like a bad thing if it's healthy? No, no. I, I like That's okay? Okay, okay. It's not a mark against it. All right. Okay, cool. So for some people it is, right? Yeah, but um, okay, good. So um, this photograph I took in a, in a farmer's market in Mexico. Um, you can see tomatillos. I don't know if you have any green salsa today with the tacos. Maybe, um, which, uh, you know, are a really basic ingredient, um, some fruits. This is a scene um, from the kind of market that people have um, gotten their food from for ever. Um, when Cortez came to Tenochtitlan, uh, which is today Mexico City, um, he found a bustling market um, in which the Mexica people, which is the name we use for the Aztecs, um, could buy fresh fish from both the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean in Mexico City, which is really far from both of those oceans, um, and, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. So food, the food system in what is today Mexico has, you know, been very um, encompassed producers and eaters from places really far distances away um, for hundreds of years long before uh, Europeans arrived. Um, However, uh, in the last 20 years, since uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, which really made it easier for um, corporations to access uh, the markets across borders in the North American region, Canada, US, and Mexico, um, there's been a transformation of the food system. So today, Mexico um, imports 40% of its food. So this is becoming an increasingly small portion of how people access their food. And this is becoming an increasingly large portion of how people access the things that they eat and drink. Um, you'll never see so many varieties of Coca-Cola as you'll see in a Mexican supermarket. Um, and this is, you know, probably, uh, this is a Walmart. Um, Walmart is one of the biggest retailers in Mexico today. Um, there's a OXO. OXO is like 7-Eleven. OXO and 7-Eleven open a new store every single day somewhere in Mexico. Um, more and more people are getting uh, more and more of their food from uh, places like 7-Eleven, which, you know, like here exist, you know, usually with a gas station, um, on the road, the kind of place that you can pop in and out with, you know, soda, chips, ice, beer, um, not fresh food per se usually. Um, and then Walmarts, big giant supermarkets. Um, so this market is in a place called Tehuacan, which is the birthplace of corn. We'll be eating corn tortillas later. Um, it's the place that thousands of years ago it said that indigenous people um, midwifed corn into existence for the first time by pollinating it. Corn can't self-pollinate. It requires humans. Um, so there are a lot of uh, origin stories about how humans and corn depend on one another and need each other to exist. Um, so in Tehuacan, which is a market city, going back again hundreds of years, um, there used to be the, the biggest market in the region. Um, and today, instead, on all four corners of the city, you see four Walmarts. Um, so 
we want to think about what, you know, what the food system means, what the food system brings into reach and takes out of reach um, for us. Um, sometimes that can be um, in circumstances that are out of our control. So if you're living at college, you probably depend a lot on what the college food service <laughs> provides to you or doesn't provide to you. If you're living in a rural community or an urban community, you depend on um, the systems and structures that are going to bring you your food, um, or you know, uh, if you're producing your food, you're going to depend on things like the climate and irrigation um, to help you produce that. So um, it's important to think about you know how um, food, the food system can be, for example, leptogenic or obesogenic. Leptogenic producing um, you know health. Uh, obesogenic producing, you know, more likely to lead to obesity. Um, food deserts, um, which can be a, a term that's used uh, for, for a lack of access to healthy and fresh foods. Food swamps, which is a new term that a lot of people are using that refers to an excess of not healthy food, right? Not an absence of food, but an excess of unhealthy food. And now the term that I prefer that a lot of people are using, food apartheid. Right, which is referring to this, the choices that policymakers and retailers and uh, other people involved with the food system are making um, that result in a kind of structural racism, a structural violence, a structural inequality um, that produces certain kinds of food environments in certain kinds of places. Um, so when Mexico signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, it, wa it wanted to transform its economy. The goal was to push its economy into the 21st century, um, to make it more modern, more technological. Um, there was a goal to push people out of the countryside and off of their land so that they could um, participate in a modern e economy, get manufacturing jobs, technological jobs. Um, this was seen as progress. This was seen as modernity. This was the goal that Mexico was seeking. It was a model of economic development that was a product of our institutions in the United States because most of the economic team that negotiated NAFTA on the behalf of the Mexican government, just like the team that was negotiating on behalf of the US government, went to Harvard and University of Chicago. <laughs> and they shared the same principles, the market-friendly, market-oriented principles as far as what development, economic development looked like. And for them, economic development is Walmart. <laughs> it is this kind of um, uh, economic development. So there was a calculus that was made that 50,000 people would be displaced from the land um, as a result of NAFTA. Anyone have any guesses about, sorry, 500,000. I'm already getting the numbers wrong. 500,000 people would be displaced from NAFTA. Any guesses about how accurate that was? 1 20th. Uh, that was the, it turned out to be the year that was displaced, the amount that was displaced every year in the first 20 years of NAFTA. Okay. So when we talk about today immigration being an, an, an issue of national importance, a crisis in the United States, this policy triggered that wave. Um, I work with uh, people in New York City who come from the state of Puebla. The state of Puebla was not, a, uh, migrant was not a migrant sending state before NAFTA. After NAFTA, there are whole towns that now live in the Bronx <laughs> and Brooklyn. Um, so we saw 10% um, of the Mexican population moving to the United States in the 20 years after, after NAFTA. And in rural communities, we see a transformation. So this is the town. Um, some of my friends who live in the Bronx, this is their hometown, um, San Antonio Texcala, <coughs> which is in the state of Puebla near Tehuacan, but out in the countryside. Um, and the first day that their road into town was paved, guess what went down the road first? The first thing to use the road was the Coca-Cola truck. Um, and so when we think about things like trade deals, which have these goals of economic development, we have to think about the unintended consequences. And we have to think about the ripple effects. And no one, when NAFTA was being negotiated in the early 90s, uh, no one said, 
is this going to have a public health impact? That was not on the radar. Um, it was not any of, the, any of the statistical modeling, the calculations were not taking into consideration the public health impact. Um, so that's what my book does. You already saw the cover. Um, these were some of the questions, the questions that I started my presentation with. You know, what is a food system? How does it work? How does our health relate to the food system? Um, motivated my, my inquiry. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, but I find as an anthropologist, I like stories that have vivid detail. I'm not a policy analyst. I'm not an economist. Um, by training, I found my way into um, looking at policy through a rather, you know, untraditional route. So um, to start our story, we're going to go to Copenhagen <laughs> first. Um, and you may say, why Copenhagen? Um, because we're living in a moment. I don't know if, is anyone here a fan of the f food, uh, foodie? <laughs> Universe, Food Channel, Food Magazines, yes, okay, good, I'm with my people. Okay, so this is the New York Times Tea Magazine, which is the fashion magazine of the Times. Um, 2014 had an article, um, you know, in search of the perfect taco. They had me at taco, I was ready to <laughs> read whatever followed, and I read this avidly because it is an article about tacos and about Mexico, and it features beautiful photography, um, but it, is focusing on Rene Redzepi. Anyone familiar with this guy? Okay, so he's been named the top chef in the world by various publications. His restaurant Noma in Copenhagen um, was one of the top 10 restaurants in the world according to Michelin and some other guides. Um, and he's, uh, he's the person credited with um, kind of advancing the idea of really local food. So in, in Noma, in his restaurant, they would, you know, scrape uh, barnacles off the dock outside the restaurant, you know, in the bay and serve those. They would get moss off the trees, lichen, musk ox, something, skin, I don't know, um, <laughs> all kinds of things that people didn't traditionally think of as edible, but super, 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 super local, right? So this sort of celebration of really simplistic, um, really local base primary ingredients that are attached to a place. So Rene Redzepi maybe gets bored, you know, pleasing the palates of, you know, the global elite in Copenhagen and takes a vacation to Mexico. And the New York Times sends a reporter along, and there are other chef friends that are joining him on this journey. And um, in this article, it describes what I describe in the book as kind of a bro fest of discovery, in which these you know chefs who happen to be men and happen to not be Mexican, one Mexican chef joins the fun. Um, literally. Uh, it, Jeff Gordonier describes bouncing, you know, through the jungle in a jeep, um, you know, looking at the looking at the wildlife and the plants and foraging and and um, you know this kind of experience of discovery. They even use the language of um, of conquest, but ironically, it's Rene Redzepi that talks about how he loses his virginity by eating. Uh, and frijoladas, which I think there's a picture of somewhere, um, which are basically a tortilla with beans on it. So he says that my, my virginity was taken in the best possible way. So we have this sort of ironic European goes to the jungle and he's the one that loses his virginity. I, I, I don't really understand, but it's, it's sort of this colonialist fantasy of discovery, of, um, of conquest, but he's framing it as being him discovering and paying homage, bringing this story to the rest of the world, right? And storytelling, as I describe in my book, is a, is a kind of capital, right? Not all of us have access um, to the means to, to make our stories heard, to claim ownership for our stories. Um, so he no self-nominates to tell the story of tacos and of tortillas. And so fast forward, you know, there's a lot of other things that come from this. Um, so I'm going to just show you. I'm going to put on a video in the background um, just as I talk for a moment. Um, so this is one of the products of his, of his inquiry, which is, um, I want no sound. Let's see. Yeah, no sound. 
I'm just going to talk over it, and you'll have the visual um, to see. Um, so this is Rene Redzepi, um, and this is Rocio Sanchez, who's a, a Chicago-born Mexican-American chef. And he says in the video, um, you'll notice he does all the talking, um, that she's been researching tortilla. And so he's reporting back to the world um, from what looks, you know, a little bit like a kitchen lab in space, right? There's no kind of location here. There's no um, sign that we're in a place with a history and a people. Um, in fact, you know, the Noma kitchen labs are labs. They're distinct from the restaurant. They're distinct from the urban environment that they're in. Um, just about the most elite kind of cooking experimentation space that you can imagine. So he's describing here um, the process for making tortillas in the traditional way, which involves nixtamalizing corn. Um, corn, the Mesoamericans discovered, if it's soaked overnight with mineral lime, um, nixtamal, um, at, brought to a boil and then soaked and then ground the next day, it releases um, and not only makes the corn really soft and chewy and delicious in your tortillas, but it also releases the niacin, um, the B vitamins that actually make um, it incredibly nutritious and it prevents you from getting really terrible um, diseases that come from vitamin deficiency, which when corn went to Italy and Italians fell in love with polenta, they didn't transfer that that knowledge, and in fact, many Italians died of pellagra, which is a vitamin B deficiency related disease. Other s side story. Anyway, here we have them, you know, making the tortillas. Um, in Mexico, you would have a flame. So, just to, you know, did you see that, by the way? <laughs> Frisbee throw, right? You don't throw tortillas. <laughs> um, he throws it because it doesn't souffle properly, the first one. So this is already a little bit insulting and offensive um, if you show it to people who make tortillas because you aren't supposed to throw a tortilla on the floor. Um, and then, you know, there's no flame, there's no firewood. Um, even the, the, the bowl, the lava rock, lava stone bowl that's being used is not something that you can grind corn in. Corn is ground, ground on a metate um, traditionally, which is a slab of stone, and you have to use your whole body um, to, to grind it. You can't grind it like that. That's for spices or guacamole. Um, so there are aspects here which are, on the one hand, very reverent, very um, respectful in terms of celebrating this tradition, and on the other hand, getting a lot of things really wrong. Um, in fact, he, he mispronounces some of the words. He, he gets them you know, so that they're somewhat unrecognizable if you aren't familiar with what he's already talking about. Um, so this is you know, an example of what comes of it. So if, um, let me just go back. Okay, so basically, um, you know, we have this sort of celebration of, of, of corn, of traditional um, Mexican food, what, what I call the milpa-based cuisine, which is the corn-centered diet um, of Mesoamericans going back thousands of years. Um, but it's being celebrated, it's being taken out of its place of origin, being taken away from the hands of the people who, who do this traditionally, um, being severed from those cultural ties, being preserved sort of in this kind of archival way, um, but really distanced from, from the cultural context um, of its origins. Um, so this is in contrast um, to how corn operates in these places, right? So um, map of Mexico, um, Mexico City, uh, the state of Puebla is the kind of lopsided uh, state right here. This is Guerrero, this is Oaxaca. This region, the Mixteca, is the region that sent the most migrants to the New York region. Um, it used to be that almost everybody was from Puebla, but now if you ask people, you're likely to get an answer of one of these three states, or a lot of people from Mexico City and from other states as well as the community has grown and gotten more diverse. Um, so if you go to this region, um, a place like San Jose, Miahuatlan, Puebla, you're going to see scenes like this. So this is corn culture. Um, this is what the way that corn is grown and produced um, in communities going back thousands of years. So again, near Tehuacan, near the birthplace of corn, um, 
people spend a lot of their time um, working with corn. So you plant it, you harvest it, you dry it in the sun, you keep the leaves for your tamales, you dry the leaves and then you use them to wrap tamales. Um, the corn cobs, um, after being dried, you would save the corn kernels, you would replant them um, the following season. If they were especially good, you would take special care to make sure you keep the, the best kernels for planting the following year. And you have, you plant corn two or three times a year, so you have corn for your tortillas, your tamales, all of your main food items for three to six months, uh, depending on, on um, how often you plant. Um, a lot of communities, uh, I think this guy might be wearing a hat that says Hard Rock Cafe or something. A lot of people in this particular community, even though Puebla sends a lot of people to New York, San Jose Mia Huatlan sends people to Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and Las Vegas, Nevada. And so you'll find as you walk around a lot of people wearing t-shirts that say Las Vegas or, or Portland or the sports teams from those places. Um, and it's somewhat unusual to see someone of his age, but I suspect that he is, so someone of his age is, is often either getting ready to go to migrate or is being protected from migration by siblings who've already migrated and might be sending money back so he can stay in school. Um, most people in this community don't want their children growing corn. <laughs> it's considered very um, a dead end economically and socially. It's considered um, low social mobility. And so they want their, their, their young uh, children to, to stay in school, um, to go to college, to become professionals, not to grow corn. Um, this is uh, an example of um, how corn um, is ground. So I described the metate. Nobody uses metates anymore, really since the 60s or 70s. Most people use a big metal electrical corn grinder where you soak it overnight and then you bring it in the morning, sometimes you know, traditionally four or five, six in the morning. You bring your bucket of corn, you feed it into here, and out comes the masa, and you take it back home and make your tortillas or your tamales. Um, this is the end result, the delicious <laughs> end result. This is how, you know, unlike that electric cook cooktop that we saw with no flame, with no um, comal, this is a comal over a, a wood fire um, in an outdoor kitchen. This is my friend's mother. Um, and she's making memelas, which are somewhat thick tortillas. Um, they are, they're made like tortillas, and you take them off the flame. You crimp. I don't know how they do it without burning their fingers. You uh, wait as little time as possible so that it's still flexible, and you crimp the sides. If you're me, you wait till it's too cold, and then it's really hard to do because I don't like burning my fingers, but somehow she has no nerves in her fingertips. Um, you can see her hands literally like on the comal, which is fiery hot. Um, you crimp the edges, you, you heat it up again, and then you put, you know, maybe chorizo, salsa, asiento, which is a kind of oil, uh, lard-based oil, a little bit of sprinkling of cheese, and you have a delicious snack. This is an example of, um, you know, another set of corn farmers wearing, I think, uh, Las Vegas and New York hats. Um, this young man is wearing a, a, a school uniform. Um, and they, these guys actually, this is not their corn field, well, they're corn farmers, but they, um, they also um, are goat herders. And so they use, uh, after the corn has been harvested, the goats come in and graze, and so the goats get nice and fat because the goats can somehow digest um, corn stalks, which has got to be really hard on the stomach, but not for them. Um, and then this is an example of another way that corn is eaten. Um, so elotes, esquites, um, I saw on your flyer for this week, um, Coca-Cola is now using elotes and it's marketing to sell Coca-Cola, right? Elotes is a very pre-Columbian um, kind of, of, of treat, right? To pair it with a Coke, right? This sort of idea of celebrating ancestral food, also pairing it with a Coke, right? So this sort of mixed message, which is different from um, 
what Coca-Cola also does, which is pair your Coke with a cheeseburger, pair your Coke with, you know, a, a, a non-ancestral uh, kind of, of snack. Um, so for a lot of people um, in Mexico, this, this is the kind of thing that is um, unhealthy. So if we go back to... Um, if we go back to the colonial period, um, anybody here study colonial Latin American history at all? No? No Latin American studies classes? Maybe one or two? Okay. Um, the, uh, the Spanish had very um, rigid ideas about a lot of things, but one of the things they had an idea about was the street is indecent, right? <laughs> Anything that happens outside the confines of the home is by definition indecent. So. Um, Women uh, of social, any social class that permitted it, right? If you were, if you had one foot in the middle class, um, you kept your women indoors because just by virtue of being outside of the house, unaccompanied, unchaperoned, unless it was going to church, was indecent, right? So imagine the women who are market women, right? Or women who were slaves, or women who um, were. Uh, you know, did other kinds of manual labor, domestic labor. Just by virtue of being out of the house, they were disrespected, right? There was no way to be respectable and be outside of the house unless you were going to church. Um, this extends to all kinds of things, right? So the street, eating in the street, indecent, <laughs> right? Anything that happens in the street is dirty, unsanitary, uncivilized, un-European, right? So there are these ideas that that get um, established in the colonial period that carry through to this day. So I'm going to hold that idea in your mind because we're going to talk about what happens when we have a convergence of these old, racialized, racist, classist, gendered notions of propriety, of civilization. What happens when they clash with NAFTA? with globalization, with the corporate context today, and with the health consequences of NAFTA, which we're about to dive into, right? So we want to think about, you know, is, the, you know, is this healthy? Is this good? Is this healthy? How about this, right? <laughs> is this good? Do we like this? Is it, how about this, right? So, you know, Dori Locos, anybody ever had Dori Locos? I think Taco Bell was trying to do it too, but they originated on the street in Mexico. Um, you slice open a bag of Doritos, you layer in cucumber, mango, all fresh fruits and veg, chamoy, uh, chili, all kinds of chili sauce, lime. Uh, you eat it with a with a fork, or you eat the chips um, with your fingers, right? So, human creativity. I just I'm never I never cease to be impressed. Right? This is an incredible thing. But what we see is that all of these factors, these changes, this is why I made you move up, because you can actually maybe read this slide. Um, we can see these changes are having a health impact. So when we look globally, this is a global World Health Organization slide, um, what causes deaths around the world? Mortality, right? Uh, when we look at low income, middle income, lower middle, upper middle, and high income countries, in 2005, we can see that low-income countries are still battling infectious diseases, right? So things like um, cholera that come from poor sanitation, from contaminated water, are taking more deaths in low-income countries than other causes. And high-income countries, those are almost vanquished, right? They're really a non-issue, and we see chronic disease taking more, more lives. When we look at the forecast for 2015, we see chronic diseases are expected to overtake infectious diseases in every country, right? So a 10-year period, right? If we only look at the blue bar, we've got, you know, the best moment in human history. <laughs> infectious diseases vanquished, done. Right? People are not dying of cholera to the same magnitude. Right? This isn't quite achieved. This was a projection, but this is, um, you know, the goal is to vanquish these things so children are not dying because they don't have clean water. Right? Um, but instead, we see a, a rise in chronic disease. Right? 
All of you have heard about the drug war in Mexico and the drug violence, right? You can't avoid hearing about it. Guess what? More people die every year from diabetes in Mexico, every year, than in the drug war all put together. So what we have is a, is a slow death, a, a situation of structural violence in which some people are being disproportionately impacted by changes in the economy and they're facing the health consequences. So when we look at the same period for Mexico, 2005 to 2015, we can see a rise in violence, but violence is still cause number eight of mortality. Heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, um, and cerebrovascular disease, a stroke, are the top four causes of death. Um, it looks pretty steady, but then look at that column. Look at how much they're increasing every year. The incredibly dramatic rise in chronic diseases as a cause of death. So Mexicans are literally dying as a result of NAFTA. And we can see that it's caused a tremendous public health panic, crisis, um, Mexi all of the gains that Mexico has achieved through changing its economy are going to go through their hands because now so many people are sick and unable to work, right? So we have 10 million diabetics, 24 million pre-diabetics. Um, we have 65 to 70,000 deaths to diabetes each year. This is actually, this graphic is about three years old. It's actually closer to 80,000 now. Um, 13 uh, billion dollars spent by Mexico in 2011 to address diabetes and obesity, public health dollars. $700 per capita that the government dedicates to diabetes, right? This is a tremendous social cost, obviously um, emotional cost, and cost, cost in the financial. And we see, you know, an incredible re response, reaction. We see um, a growing um, awareness. We see a growing public sub civil society response. Um, this is an action that happened just before Christmas. They had a Santa Claus, you know how Coca-Cola does the polar bears and Santa Claus marketing. So they had somebody dressed as Santa Claus and they had the Coca-Cola can with diabetes, right? Mexico has the biggest number of new cases of diabetes in the world. It's urgent to, cons to uh, reduce consumption of sugary beverages, 24,000 deaths from sugary beverages per year, right? That's just the toll, the death toll from sodas in particular. One in three Mexican children will develop diabetes, 10 million Mexicans uh, suffering from diabetes, right? So we have this tremendous response. We can also see in the government, we see a, a massive public health campaign that involves multiple government agencies. Um, this is one of the advertisements that sort of promotes this campaign. Um, and one of the you know, achievements of the NAFTA mindset, the NAFTA framing, um, that goes along with, you know, if you'll remember when I showed you, I'm just going to scroll backwards for a second. I showed you this slide. Um, there are people who ask us, um, you know, there are people who say that this is the dream, right? This is freedom, right? When we talk about um, public health policy, people say, you know, keep your government hands off of my soda, my soda portion size. When Mayor Bloomberg in New York City um, tried to pass a soda tax, there were people who said, you know, please don't tell me what kind of soda I can buy, right? So there's an argument that's being made that this is freedom, that this is choice, that this is progress, right? Um, and that if we want people to be healthy, we have to teach them, educate them to consume in moderation. Right? So there's a, a very market-oriented um, notion of how to be healthy, how to stay healthy, how to get healthy 
if one is not healthy, um, when what we can see is that the entire landscape has been transformed, right? So everything has been shifted, right? Though that beautiful marketplace in Tehuacan is replaced by four Walmarts. Um, the fresh fruits and vegetables are replaced by every variety of Coca-Cola. Um, tortillas are replaced by, uh, if, if not store-bought tortillas, by the, by the cereals and the breads and the packaged foods. Um, and then when people are sick, which they are in huge numbers, this is the message. The message is get your health checkup, moderate, right? Measure yourself when you're serving yourself and, you know, literally measure yourself. Keep an eye on how much you weigh, on your, you know, your weight, um, your waist circumference, your BMI, right? BMI is a big part of this. And move your body, right? Get some exercise. But there is no acknowledgement in this multi-sectoral strategy to, uh, of, of how the food system has alt been altered and how the alterations in that food system are a direct consequence of choices and ideas about how economic development is uh, framed and understood and defined. And so, you know, it's up to you and us. Um, you know, interestingly, we actually have a really big role <laughs> in this because when we elect our elected officials um, and we put pressure, our elected officials then go to the negotiating table and put pressure on our trading partners to accept our Coca-Cola and our <laughs> Kellogg's products. Um, we are, making, we are making choices. In some cases, we're making choices that are much bigger than our elected officials' um, jurisdiction or constituency in our own local regions, right? So um, some of the ideas that you know, I think are interesting to think about, some of the movements that are out there, um, you know, eating in a decolonized way, thinking about um, you know, rather than how, much, how many calories or how many grams of sugar does this thing have, is this something that people in, in your own family um, or in this place um, would have considered food, would have considered to be food, right? Um, nopales are cactus leaves, right, that are very uh, cactus paddles that are a big staple in a lot of regions in Mexico. Very delicious. Um, not all of us are going to eat nopales, but the message is, what is, you know, what, going back, you know, pre, not only pre-NAFTA, but pre-Europeans, what kind of food did we eat in this place right here, right, literally here in Pennsylvania, right? There were food practices. Um, I guarantee there was a lot of turkey involved. There was a lot of corn. There was a lot of berries, a lot of fish, right? There were no big, uh, you know, there were no pigs or cows, right, no dairy. Um, so thinking about that, right, not that we're all going to do that necessarily all the time, but, but as a thought exercise, right, what would it be like if we decolonized our diet? And then also thinking about cooking as a radical act, right? What does it mean um, to cook or not cook, right? If we, if we don't cook, um, do we, are we more susceptible to what the food system is giving us, right? And there are people who take it even further. Yesterday I was at a conference where it was all radical um, urban farmers, you know, who are growing vegetables in Bushwick, Brooklyn, you know, really cool stuff. You know, some people say it's not just about cooking, it's about literally growing your own food, foraging your own food, catching fish, etc. I don't know if we're all going to be doing that, but it's, again, an interesting thought experiment to think about, you know, where do we draw the line? Where do we take back some of the power and control? Um, whether it's just in interrogating, you know, the food that's on offer, maybe in your food service, you know, is it uh, the kind of food that you're happy with, that you're comfortable with, that fits your values? Um, and then when you're preparing your own food, what kinds of choices are you making? Um, and how do these ripple effects, you know, um, waft out into the hemisphere in ways that we may or may not be aware of? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.